Hello and welcome to the BAP. This is episode 50 for the 17th of April 2016. Congratulations, lads. 50 episodes. Almost a year now. We've got this show and then two others and we've basically clocked off a year. Well we, have, we have missed Well, it. you have. I, I didn't start till episode seven. And also, we didn't miss a couple of episodes. So, we've technically probably gone over the year, mate. Don't tarnish our 50th episodes with all the negativity. No, no, this is positivity. <laughs> oh, okay. Doesn't this mean we probably almost had an exactly... I can't remember we, the day we've, we started. We've gone a year because we skipped Easter and we skipped Christmas at least. Okay. Anywho, we are broadcasting from the progressive bubble. Where as a nod to Twilight Imperium fans... On this day in 1907, Brazil oh. became the third country in the world to start construction on a dreadnought battleship, sparking a vastly expensive South American naval arms race. My name is Franco, and joining me is Barnaby Jace and Corey Dean. Barnaby Jace! <laughs> Stomping down progressivism. I think I prefer that to Corey uh, Dean. Yeah, I know, you won that. You won that. Oh. You're on, running the country at the moment. On today's show, I believe Barnaby Jace will be covering... Winding back social security and Corey Dean, I believe you will be tackling political correctness. Has it gone too far? <laughs> I'll also be executing a few celebrities' dogs in the uh, <laughs> or threatening to at least. <laughs> I do like the way Barnaby J sort of rolls off the tongue. It's really quite good. I don't know how we didn't come up with that earlier. Barnaby J. <laughs> douchebag filterage. Does anyone uh, have anything? I, I was going to launch into some douchebag filter, but then I realised I watched the wrong show. <laughs> Do, do tell. Well, dear listeners, <laughs> I, I mentioned that um, I was watching quite a good series from the BBC called Luther. And I went, Brother Jason went took and watched, it as Lucifer. <laughs> went and watched Lucifer and discovered a show that um, I pretty much want to. You pretty want much want to beat the uh, the main character. Do you do you want that hour of your life back? Is it that bad? No, no, it wasn't that bad. It wasn't. There was some interesting. to some. Funny writing and so stuff like that. So is the main character the, the title character? He is, in fact, character? Lucifer. He is, yes. He is the Lord of Darkness. Spoiler he, alert. He's just hanging around in... Well, no, you figure that out in the first five minutes. He, he goes around telling everyone. So, this is no, definitely, Do they believe him, though? No one really believes him. Because if someone walked up to me like, hey, I'm the Lord of Darkness, I'd be like, yeah, you're right. No, crazy. no, he's completely upfront about it and he manipulates people and does all this kind of stuff and they just don't seem to notice that he's actually the Lord of Darkness, yeah. So as a barometer of how good or bad it is, if we're saying Little Nicky, Adam Sandler movie, is pretty much ground level appalling, where's it sort of fitting? Popeye's chicken is awesome. (laughs) (laughs) I I would give it, I can't even think of a show to compare it to Hmm. on that level. Maybe American Horror Story, the second series, the one that wasn't as good as the first. Look, there are five seasons now, each of them not as good as the first. Actually, that's a lie. The clown in the... Carnival one is very scary. Clowns always are. Clowns with knives are. Uh, well, okay. gentlemen, can I ask you to prepare your golf claps? This week... Oh, that's a bit hard. I'm holding a microphone. I started watching Rick and Morty. Season one. I assume that golf clap is, is from me too. Congratulations. It's Have a great show. Have you binge watched the entire season by now? There are only 10 minute episodes. Um, no, I haven't binge watched it because I, I don't know. For me, it's not a binging show. I, I watch one episode and that's oh. enough at a time. That's enough. You're like, one, that is too much craziness. One episode one a day is enough for me. One Rick and Morty a day. No. I'm still warming to it. I can sort of see I the think, appeal. I think Jason showed me the first episode and then, and we, then we proceeded watched. to binge watch the whole season. <laughs> right. It was like 10 episodes in there. Yeah, 10, it, was, it was like an half. Yeah. For, <laughs> for me, it seems like an adult version of Adventure Time. It's sort of yeah. finding its way. Well, like you Hang watch- on. Some people would say Adventure Time is an adult version of Adventure Time. That's Adventure true. Adventure Time is pretty good. It's true. It gets really dark <laughs> as well <laughs> later right. on. So does Rick and Morty get quite dark. Mm. I mean, spoiler alert, Jake loses his arm. No, Jake's the dog. Finn loses his arm at one point. It's no, not really a children's cartoon. I wanted the spoiler. No, spoiler no, no Rick and Morty spoilers. I'm only into episode three. So, I mean, you told me I should be watching this at least five years yeah. ago. Yeah, we did. And I ignored all that recommendation. And you actually went out and watched a show called Brick and Shorty. <laughs> <laughs> but as the uh, barometer of all things that I should watch... Netflix, it came on there. So it was like, well, I can't deny Rick and <laughs> I'm Morty. I'm going to golf clap Dean for that. <laughs> so, does anyone watched anything new this week or played anything new? We're bringing games into this bag filterage. Well, well I, was, I haven't really played anything new, but it's, it's something to do with a game that I do play fairly often. And um, it's just a little interesting tidbit of information. There was this a fairly large tournament Blizzard ran called Heroes of the Dorm, which was a tournament based around the, the MOBA game. Um, Heroes of the Storm, which is a bit like League of Legends or Dota, if anyone knows about those ones. And up for, up at stake for the five winning contestants was their entire career tuition. 
So uh, there were five hundred thousand dollars worth of scholarships involved and stuff. And, what? So and like university or college education? They put together teams. Yeah, they're, so they're, if you, their tuition. If you skipped their... out in your studies and were a poor student, and spent all your time <laughs> playing League of Legends, Blizzard will fund you <laughs> to flunk out of college. No, no, no. They would not if you played League of Legends. If you played Heroes of Heroes of Storm. Oh wait, yeah. sorry, yeah. sorry, my, Please. my bad. There's uh, a there's a distinct difference. Fair and, enough. Uh, <laughs> and um, but I, I just thought it was interesting because there's there, there's significant tournaments coming up for these sorts of games, esports events and things like that. And the, the amount of the crowd that, that were watching it, because I was watching it in that, the crowd was quite huge as they, as they cheered on Arizona State over University of Arlington, Texas and Arlington, I think. So, and they won $500,000 worth of scholarships. Was it wow. just between, because it's team based, right? I'm not so there was yet the qualifying, there was a bracket, there was a 16, a bracketed 16 team. So uh, is it split? Team. How many was on the team? Five, five. So you each got a hundred thousand. They said I, the only the only numbers I couldn't see what individuals won, but the uh, at stake was you win you, the tuition for your. It said career tuition. So what that actually involves, I don't know. But they said there was five hundred thousand dollars worth of uh, scholarships up for grabs. So. so that probably gets you through one semester in um, you know B level accounting. <laughs> well, no, they, if they said their career tuition, then that's that's the eighty thousand dollars that it might have cost them for their whatever. Tuition at whatever um, career they're looking at. What if they wanted to just be a professional MOBA player? Well, that's. Pretty I mean, you've cheap. already won. Then that's pretty cheap. Isn't half it? a million. <laughs> that's a good prize. I mean, these, these are nothing compared to what's happening over in South Korea with the kind of prize mm. money they're throwing around over there. So, I, I enjoy watching. I mean, these are these MOBA games. Um, I'm trying to think of what that stands for. Mul- massive online battle arena, multiplayer online battle. I feel arena. Like you made that up, but it's probably pretty accurate. It's close, close-ish. And um, they're, they're getting big crowds and they're quite enjoyable to watch, but you have to kind of be a player to really appreciate what's even going on on the screen. So I don't know how widespread they're going to they're gonna, they're gonna get eventually. Yeah, I get that. I, I watch uh, X-Wing miniatures games on YouTube and also Netrunner. Uh, and if you didn't know the rules of those games, it would make no sense to you what's going on. <laughs> exactly. But when you understand the game, it's really in, in, it's, it's intriguing. It's, it's good. Like really good to watch. Yeah. So, Dan, you've been um, sinking a vast amount of time in the division. Do you have an update for our I would, listeners? I wouldn't say I finished the game, Frank. You finished, finished it? The game. I'm, I'm max level. Uh, yeah. I, I Look, I had it for a week and I beat the story now. That's pretty good. And then we got to end game, and we've been doing the hard event dungeon things. They're not dungeons because you've got a gun and you're like a special forces guy, but whatever. And uh, we've been doing the PvP stuff in the, in the center, in Central Park and stuff like Kicking ass. It's good fun. I'm enjoying it a lot. Um, I even didn't play the Doom beta this weekend. The new Doom is out. And I opted to play the Division instead, which is is pretty big because I quite like Doom. And it's got real-time chainsaw dismemberments. Oh. You should watch the videos for that. It's, well, obviously not because you like chainsaw dismemberments, but because it's pretty impressive technically. Well, back in the day when I did used to play um, RPGs, Doom was a favourite back in my university days in... A very long time ago, which I won't I mention. too have fond memories of Doom, which is why I thought I would like to play the beta. Didn't. I have fond memories of Doom, playing it, um, <coughs> closing out entire computer labs at university. So, Well, that's the it. That was the <laughs> first game that, <laughs> yeah, yeah, where lockdowns. you did that. Yeah. And then having the, uh, the computer lab uh, administrators come by and close you all out of the computers <laughs> if, if they found you on it. So. I mean, back in 1992, when Doom was at the top level and you would go into a university and you could link up the computers so you were playing each other I mean that that blew my mind I mean today you can just sit at home and you jump on the net you're playing yeah. people all around the world but back then to go wow I'm playing someone you three rows that. over that's yeah, yeah. awesome someone on another computer on a completely in the same different room. computer <laughs> six feet away from me yeah. we're not sharing the what keyboard age I think the big one for me was Command and Conquer when that came in because I was never any good at first person shooters I always got my ass kicked but uh, Command and Conquer was the the First, not the first one, but the first sort of biggish RTS. Um, it was it was the first one after June, pretty pretty much. And June did new multiplayer. Yeah, Link Command Conk was the first, and, and that long. that was that was my. And was then my Warcraft. Game. All right, chaps. Shall we get into the um, the business part of the show? Well, I think we've filtered Let's. out those who aren't worthy well, no, of our knowledge on politics. We may actually have got them all interested now in, in video games and, now we're and television shows. We're just and then we're going to blow them off. It could be a reverse <laughs> filter. All right, so uh, we're going to switch straight into short, fast news. And this one's a good one. Ding dong, the witch is dead. Or at least her parliamentary career. Bronwyn Bishop was defeated in a pre-selection ballot, losing 39 to 51. 
uh, a former Liberal staffer, Jason Felinski, who no doubt earned a few extra votes by virtue of just not being Bronwyn Bishop, <laughs> took it out took out the win. Uh, fortunate news for the nation, Felinski is actually a moderate, at least a moderate within the Liberal Party. He defeated the hard right and also Bronwyn Bishop, who are putting up candidates. Uh, so no word yet has come out on his view, as his views on helicopters. <laughs> is he pro? Is he against? And also, don't tell the terrorists... But Bonnie Cobb is not coming after them anymore, so we're going to have to come up with another plan on that front. Huge sigh of relief oh, look, for the terrorists, I think. ISIS were probably packing their little booties, and now shit's going to get darker. <laughs> uh, I mean, I think for all people that were observing the machinations of the Liberal Party about what's been happening in her um, seat, it was pretty obvious that there were a lot of people out to move her aside. Yeah, yeah, they wanted her gone. Yeah, You can either do this the honourable way and not stand... Or we'll, no, okay, you're standing, fine. And <laughs> it's a gonna... massive embarrassment when your own party shoves you out of your own seat through a pre-selection process. Yeah, she walked out of the building uh, pretty pretty calm, pretty collected. I don't think she can cry. Uh, I could be wrong. And then certainly, drove her... certainly looked pretty, pretty you know, um, ministerial about it all. And then drove her parliamentary vehicle into well, the... Well, she flew a helicopter with... out of there. <laughs> well, she'll be <laughs> Off into the... the sunset. She'll be able to <laughs> ponder <laughs> her long career with that fat, juicy superannuation that the uh, Yeah, it's, police a, it's get. a sweet deal. They get a sweet deal. Yeah, three hundred thousand a year, I think it is for the rest of her life. She's going to be okay, isn't she? And she was Ronnie going to be all right. Yeah, she can't afford a helicopter though. It's going right. to be a bit shit now that she has to pay for the rental herself. I wonder what her what her post electoral career is going to be. Actually, I'm I'm not sure. I'm just not sure what. I think she's more employable than Tony. What you mean as a like a lobbyist going out into industry? Her, her only thing. problem was her, that she has an entitlement complex. But if she works someone with lots of money, that's happy to pay for a helicopter. If, if Ronnie's poisonous. And got moved out. Then Tony Abbott is still he's still he's, he's still standing. Still he's standing for election, and yeah, no but one. But there's different dynamics going on. I mean, she may have been poisonous from a voter uh, electability point of view, or just dragging the party down in general. But her relationships with people might be fine, mm. and that's where it, what it boils down to in terms of post political careers is: do you have the contacts that you know the um, the mm. private sector want to tap into? I think she would. I have no idea. Yeah. She's been around for tw- definitely 20, twenty-two year parliamentary career, I think. And well, that that's one aspect of it, but you know, do people like <coughs> her enough for her to be able to tap into that? And do you know, I mean, if she's being shoveled out of the party like that, does anybody trust that she has any pull within the party? Now well, that's that it. Just, Tony Abbott's been around a long time, but when Tony picks up the phone and calls, people don't answer. That's the problem for him as a as a career outside of politics. Mm. Dean always answers when when Tony calls. <laughs> To be fair, you'd answer, wouldn't you? If you'd have you pretty desperate <laughs> to call <Abbott>. us. <laughs> Tony Abbott, I'm taking this. <laughs> Sorry, boss. You have to wait. Yeah, I know it's a shareholder meeting. I've got Tony on the phone. <laughs> I need to find out what the fuck he wants to talk to me about. Yeah, yeah this is important. Uh, and moving on, I have uh, international political news. Um, while presenting at the Perimeter Institute in Waterloo, Ontario, Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was uh, jokingly asked by one of the journalists present to explain quantum computing. Now, instead of stumbling over his words like certain other politicians we will talk about in a minute... George Brandis? Darth Brandis, yes. Uh, He actually had this to say. Very simply, normal computers work uh, by... uh, No, 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 don't don't interrupt me. When you walk out of here, you will know more... No, some of you will know far less about quantum computing, but most of you, normal computers work uh, either there's power going through a wire or not. It's one or a zero. They're binary systems. Uh, What quantum states allow for is much more complex information to be encoded into a single bit. Regular computer bit is either a one or a zero, on or off. A quantum state can be much more complex than that because, as we know, uh, things can be both particle and wave at the same time, and the uncertainty around quantum uh, states uh, allows us to encode more information into a much uh, smaller computer. So uh, that's what's exciting about quantum computing, and that's what we're doing. Um, so the Internet's blown up about this. Everyone uh, all over Reddit is saying they wish they were Canadian. I kind of feel that way a lot of the time as well. It's mostly because of our political leadership here that makes me wish we were Canadian, that Justin Trudeau was the Prime Minister of Australia. That'd be amazing. But I'm pretty happy with the way he handled this, as opposed to members of our own political elite, such as, as the aforementioned, Darth Brandis, who I have a clip of as well. Well, metadata is... Um, the best metaphor I can give you is take... A, 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 imagine a letter, right? The metadata is the name and address on the envelope. 
not the content of the letter. Mm. So, uh, so will it be the sites that you, you're well, visiting? Well, it, 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 it wouldn't extend to, for example, web surfing. So what, what people are viewing on the internet um, is not going to be caught. So it's not the sites you're visiting? Well, um, what people are viewing on the internet when they web surf is not going to be caught. What will be caught is the, um, is, is the, uh, is the um, web address they communicate to. OK, so it's only... Oh, sorry, the web address, if I go to an internet site, that will be recorded and available. The, the, the web address um, is, is part of the metadata. The website? The web, the, well, the web address, the, the electronic address of, of the website. OK, but if I go to the Sky News website, the Australian website, uh, a more questionable website, that will be... Is that what we're talking about here? Well, I, that, my, 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 the, what you're viewing on the internet is not what we're interested in. This guy's our Attorney General, by the way. Yeah. It's good to see he has a strong grasp of the times he lives in. Mm. It's it's sickening to see him go. I've seen seen him questioned in the week after that, where he acts so smug, where he's talking about the yeah, nailed it, <laughs> yeah, the, the laws that they're going to be passing to crack down on privacy and stuff like that, and he's just completely smug about it, as if he didn't make any misstep whatsoever. Yeah, that is the worst interview I've ever heard anyone give. I think worst. The, the thing to note about this was Trudeau gave a rather simple explanation. And I'm not saying this in a derogatory way. He just gave a very plain English explanation oh. of um, quantum computing. Whereas Darth Brandis was trying to avoid what they were actually doing, yeah. which is basically recording where you're going. So he was saying, we're not interested in what you're seeing. And when the journalist challenged him, in, so if I go to this site, you're recording that I went there. Yeah, but no. Well, there's, there's also the, the big difference in that Trudeau was actually probably interested in educating people about the issue. Yeah. And Darth Brandis doesn't want to educate you at all about it. I the was issue. left wondering if Brandis was trying to say that they capture the IP addresses of the connection involved, but then not the rest of the uh, query string. But so they don't have where you are on that domain. But then, he, then what is. The and what the. But the journalist was asking that for the practical implication, would you know what website I went to? And the answer is yes. Yeah, we'd know you went to... But Darth Brandis doesn't want to admit yeah, that. <laughs> what, what, where they try and uh, play with words is, no, they haven't recorded the exact content on that web page, but we know you went there, so we can type that into a browser and see yeah. what you saw. So hey, well, assuming the content's static. Yeah. Exactly. As I said, one wanted to actually educate you on the matter, and the other one, Brandis, does not really want to educate anyway, you. Anyway, how good is Trudeau? Oh, yeah. He's a, he's a he's breath right. of fresh air. I, I like his style, and I, I like the way he handled that. He started out, everyone thought he was joking, and he's like, no, 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 no bear I, with, I'm not joking. I would not be able to come up with a definition that simple of what quantum computing is yeah, on no. the fly. Mm. I'm wondering if he didn't prep for it in advance, which for politicians in Australia is unheard of. Mm. Okay, so it, it, in America, there was a... Um, North Carolina recently passed an anti, uh, anti-gay, anti very discriminatory... Anti-LGBT uh, law. Anti-LGBT uh, law, yeah. There was a few things bundled into it. One of them was in um, uh, public facilities. Yes, using public facilities. So you're meant, to use, you're meant to use public facilities, and I can't remember the definition... Based on the, based based on on the your, gender you were born as. Yeah, that's right. Wait, wait. So what does you identify? So... If you were born, if on your birth certificate it says you're a male, you have. But to But if use I've if I've had everything done and I'm now physically a woman, the law says no. I have to what go to the born as. You have to yes. go to men's room. That's yes. kind of weird. Yeah. Anyway, this, this is a much more serious sort of uh, note for you guys to take. Whereas I just wanted to point out that the porn site X Hamster has banned all North Carolina. Uh, all, all requests for addresses from North Carolina. So no so porn the, from X Hamster. <laughs> ranting and formed a mob outside. The, um, I, I, it's only just happened this week. I don't know whether there's any significant fallout from this, but is, they've said. Is that a big website? It's a big. It's one of the bigger because it's not. Like, I, I've heard of Red Tube. I've not heard of X Hamster. X Hamster's one of the ones that Red Tube probably is references that, and things like that. Is that a, is that a post-op hamster like it used to be a hamster now <laughs> it's an ex-hamster it's an ex-hamster so it would have to go to the bathroom hamster. belonging it's, to hamsters it's and not the hamster. bathroom belonging to well I believe it's an offshoot with. of the nation of Islam and <laughs> <laughs> anyway so it was just ex-hamster ex decided to announce quite publicly that they were going to be there will be no porn being served via their, via their um, and systems to A number to of North other Carolina. businesses have talked yeah. about doing There's similar things no porn no Bruce Springsteen <laughs> he cancelled his concert there wow there Fair enough. Go. The boss. He said no. <laughs> when the boss says no, people should listen. So anyway, these um, they also made a point of pointing out some of the um, the amount of uh, search terms coming out of North Carolina where they were looking for transsexual 
or any of these other particular search terms within their pornography. So <laughs> they were pointing out a little bit of hypocrisy as well. North Wait, Dakota so, suffers. So people, North Carolina, people in oh, North sorry. Carolina predominantly search for transsexual porn. I don't think it was predominantly or anything like that. They just said, "Hey, look, there's something like three percent of the terms all searched here are this and things like that." So your, uh, I feel like that would be an interesting cache of data to have. Like you could just give people observations on their state, like weird observations as well. It doesn't really help possible. the debate, but you're like, "Hey, three percent of your people searching That's for right. this." Just as a, as a side note of, of that um, North Carolina passing that law, when politicians were asked, why are you um, presenting this law to be put into place? Their main argument was, we can't have males going into female toilets and raping women. That's, yeah, that's right. Even though there's been no, no examples reporting. of transgender um, females raping women. Yeah, well, it's a case of legislating to solve a problem that doesn't exist. Exactly. Kind of thing, yeah. Wouldn't you? You'd have to be a pretty hardcore rapist if you you went out there, and your your idea for it was to get fake cans and 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 take estrogen hormones, and, and then make yourself look like a woman, and then surprise rape them. That's yeah, right. And that, that seems a, like not a crime of passion. That seems really. It's twisted. not like they're putting any locks on the doors. Exactly. Of these You're not issued with a pass key <laughs> that gets you in there. If a male wants to go into a female toilet they and can rape walk a woman, in there, yeah. he can walk in and do it. There's no one stopping them from doing that. Well, how do you know? They're, Unless you're, I've never, I've never tried, Frank. Unless, <laughs> unless you're there stopping them. Yeah. Well, know. I'm not. I'm, should I be? Is that is that what the society's <laughs> no, come I mean, to? But this is this is what, um, what people who are challenging law are putting forward, saying: A, there's been no reported cases of that happening. So what problem are you addressing? And B, you know, if men want to do that, they can do that. Yeah, it seems it's a pretty um, spurious argument, doesn't yeah. it? Like, I don't think they're going to get out of that. I worry about these lawmakers. It's like Ted Cruz seeking to ban dildos. Well, the, Years ago. what a lot of perspectives odd. say about this law, it's a down ticket issue. So basically, these politicians don't care. It's just a way for them to garner support right. uh, in the um, state house assemblies and so forth. So they're, they're rallying behind causes which people are passionate f- about from their prejudice, but there's, there's actually no problem to solve, but it's great for campaigning around. Mm. Yeah, right. What a bunch of dicks. Pretty much. So we're going to move into the long, slow news section, or the philosophical section of the news. I've sort of, sort of decided to change track with some of my entries into the show, rather than talking about pure news items, but more debatable topics. So the, one of the things that happened to me today was, on my car trip back with some friends on the way back from down south, was, uh, I can't remember how it came up, but TPP came up, Trans-Pacific Partnership. And Must have been f- a pretty boring drive. <laughs> These two fellows <laughs> went versed in the subject. So I launched into the general, the way I normally enter into this topic is, you know, no oh, preamble, Guns blazing. Just guns blazing <laughs> straight on. It's bad. But these guys stopped me because they said, why is it bad? And like, I've never had to back brief someone on what the TP is, yeah. which of the countries are involved. And because specific- you're normally talking to people like us who, well, that's you know, it. We've been reading, we've been listening to this stuff for a while. So. Which is what I want to present to you guys is: Do you think, off the top of your head, to people who aren't versed in this topic, that could be moved either way? Could you name five reasons off the bat, simple reasons for the uninitiated, why TPP is bad? Because we can be sued in foreign countries for laws yeah, that we have placed here. of our so- sovereignty, so that we can't make. We can't devise our own laws to protect our own citizenry mm. because corporations can... Yeah, we, we're handing over... And on top of that, one. they can sue for future damages as well. That'd so if they one. try and bring a product in here that we don't allow them to support, <coughs> they can then sue the government for lost profits. For, I brought that up. So I, I brought up yep. the, the topic of... I've got, a couple, I've got one or two more after that as well. Sovereign rights. Good. Yep. And how instead of, for example, for Australia, Smoking rather than um, handling that through our judiciary system, we're giving it up to tribunals organised by the TPP. Organised by those, the participating companies. But for them, yeah. that wasn't, that didn't really Not, not a deal breaker? No. Not a deal breaker. It wasn't a deal breaker until I brought up that no one's allowed to see what's in the TPP. That got them. Well, one of them. Well, it's being negotiated. No one's allowed to see In it. terms of... You know, trans, um, transnationals and corporations are allowed to participate in what goes into the TPP, yeah. but the citizens the are, cannot. are not allowed to look but into not it. Only that, Politicians I mean, can only look at it under certain circumstances. I mean, it, it's also meant to open up job markets in such a way that we'll be competing more directly with other nations in, the certain, in certain job markets, which means we're competing with other nations where they're getting paid considerably less. So we've That's, talked about job opportunity creation, yeah. which is what... You know the politicians would have us believe, which is complete bullshit. Yeah, there's... you know. So we t- I talked. That's about true that. of most trade deals, though. They always tell you. Yeah, that's, it's about that's right. Most trade deals are absolute crap. I mean, the, the NAFTA, 
um, what was the uh, there's there's the transatlantic deal that's going through. They're all very similar in the ways that they're just simply meant to open up the job markets and employee employment pools for the companies, but it doesn't really do much for the, for the employees that are actually. Yeah, well, when I went down that path in terms of that, I was challenged on, well, if it's good for American companies, it's good for Australian companies. It's not good. It's not, though, see, because foreign countries can sue under the industri- industrial state resolution process. Is that, one, is that, one, is that right? Um, ISDS. Yeah. Uh, but our own com- companies cannot. So foreign companies have more access to the judiciary system that they can then use to attack the government. Investor but our own ones can't. Investor resolution. state dispute resolution. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, Which is ridiculous. So you, you're not only giving up your power to make laws, no, no, but your companies suffer as but well. But what, what you, you hit on it right there, it's good for companies. Yeah. Australian companies is good for Australian companies. They'll make money. Well, the reason, the topic where it came it's into was Big Pharma. And I was saying, well, show doesn't really have Big Pharma companies. So it's really benefiting. Big Pharma is associated mainly generally the Americans, with yeah. some aspects of, some areas of Europe and America. Wasn't, uh, there was an Irish company looking to buy... Uh, Pfizer, weren't they? Pfizer were selling themselves yeah. to Ireland to relocate their head office somewhere they don't have to pay right. corporate taxes. That's so you say they're associated with America, but actually they're probably more Irish these days. Yeah, well, there <laughs> is Possibly, that. Yeah. But the mindset that the, the retort that I've been receiving well, so what well, they... big pharma, a big pharmaceutical <coughs> company in Australia wanted to start up, they'd be entitled to the same laws. And I'm thinking, is that how you rationalise this? So, so but they, it also gets around things some of them like the pharmaceutical benefit scheme. Did some of them think it was a good deal? Well... They were trying to be sort of um, sit on the fence of it, sort of like, well, it's fair for everyone then, isn't it? For all the countries involved. And I'm thinking, you're not really understanding here. The, the entrenched companies are not Australian companies that are benefiting from this. It doesn't even matter. It yeah. probably is Australian companies. It's not the Australian employee that's going to benefit no. from this. Well, that, and that's where I, where I sort of moved away from yeah. talking about companies specifically. I said the citizenry does not benefit from yeah. this. Uh, and I, I also started venturing it's into... corporate, not... How the trade, TPP, the trade. But the problem with the TPP is most of it is nothing to do with trade. Yeah. Talks about patent rights. Uh, um, intellectual property, there's a whole exactly. lot of that. Um, the environment side of things and what limitations they can or, or they're deciding not to put on environmental concerns and things like that. But it's sort of, when you talk about this, it's very, you start getting into it's the weeds. Dry. And people aren't really grabbing into it. As I said, the only time I got an actual raised eyebrow, and, oh, was when I said that no one's allowed to look what's in there. And that sort of got their attention yeah. to some extent. The, the big <laughs> problem I have is, is the, the control this imposes over our environmental ministers, over our health ministers, over you know any kind of safety things. What is it going to mean for plain packaging of cigarettes? What will it mean for gun ownership if American companies can all of a sudden demand to be able to sell in Australia as per their home laws? But there's all kinds of stuff that could just change overnight. Well, we got around the plain packaging rules because tobacco companies weren't allowed to use um, investor state dispute resolution. That was under the Hong Kong Treaty. Uh, there was a trade treaty we had with China. No, the TPP China. it got written into as well. It Did was it? one of the things we banded together and forced the issue okay. on. Okay. So that's just, okay. But uh, yeah, these, these, these small little isolated bannings on particular rulings yeah. like... The smoking industry, uh, fine. Tobacco industry is excluded from investor states. That leaves it open to everything yeah. else. Well, we, we and we only bad got industries. For example, the guns, the arms industry. I, 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 th- I don't know how it works. I don't think you can. A, a, a company is meant to be able to come in and say, "This is the state of laws that exist in Australia now. I'm going to operate under those laws." And then if Australia decides to change those laws, then it has the opportunity. Yeah. Okay. To- so they, you know, they had firearms, and then they got tasers, and whatever they bring out next. That's not banned here. Right? You but, can't um, all of a sudden you can't legislate them. You know. No, but what I mean is, is it, to, in order to own firearms, you've got to adhere to certain rules here. If we went and then changed those rules to be it, make it harder to purchase firearms, then perhaps a firearm manufacturer would would actually have I, cause. To they do. would definitely take yeah. you to court if you tried to do that. Much like the smoking companies take you to court when you try and <laughs> change that. You're just opening yourself <laughs> up to all kinds of litigation and and lack of control. And the citizenry can't do anything about this treaty either. Once it's in place, we're never going to get it repealed. It's interesting how easily we can, so- well, not we, but our politicians can sign away our sovereign rights and we have no say on the matter. Well, I think it doesn't get put to the vote. I think you've hit on why it's so easy because nobody knows anything about it, frankly. Well, <laughs> they don't know well no one's passionate. It. I mean, stop the boats, bang. Everyone wants a, be- wants a say on that one, but stop the TPP. Hey, hang Crickets. on, hang on. They've stopped the boats. Abbott stopped them. That's, that's done. Yeah. Well, not he always says that. You know, anyone asks him what his achievements were, if we, we stopped the boats. They stopped. If we still had a manufacturing industry that had to then that we weren't going to sell out to uh, to the nearest competitor or something like that, then we might still have a basis in which to appeal on the sort of employment side of things, mm-hmm. because the TPB opening up will, of course, make it harder for our own for people working in Australia to compete with overseas 
the people, but we don't have a manufacturing industry anymore, so it doesn't really matter. Well, for those yeah, who remember, it. it was all about China. We've got, to be, we've got to deal better with China. Exactly. Which is how TPP was being sold to us in Australia. Well, they're using it. Uh, Americans trying to use it to control China because China's not involved, are they, in the negotiations? No, China's not involved in this, but oh, they've already not. discovered ways that China can, can, uh, can even uh, benefit from it. Because only a certain percentage of whatever product is being made in whichever country has to be made there. So China could, uh, China could build something like 40% of, of a particular product, ship it to uh, Vietnam and get the rest made there and then send it over. Mm. And I think I was getting a bit mixed up. We're actually, um, Australia's actually negotiating our own TPP-esque agreement with China. Yeah, I, I know. It's, just, it's odd that China's excluded from a negotiation that involves all of their neighbors <coughs> and everyone in Well, no, it's not odd. City. That's specifically what it's about. No, I know. It's what, <laughs> specifically what it's about. But it's also odd for us to sign up for something like that. Why would we want to anger our greatest trading partner? Well, I think we're being forced by the, the Americans to get we, involved. Uh, in we are being forced, but I mean, why? What, what do they do these days? That's a very good point. It's but very why good do you question. need them? And but our trade minister didn't come forward and put all the cards on the table. And well, Andrew Rudd's what? retired now, so we're going to have to yes. ask the new trade minister. Which is what I mentioned to my colleagues. That um, Do you remember what happened with the trade minister? How he, uh, immediately after signing that agreement, yeah. he left parliament yeah. to a lucrative um, corporate job, post oh, sure. very political lucrative. career. So. Yeah, so this this is the thing that sort of concerned me was that you know well educated gentleman did not just drew a blank when I even mentioned the TPP. Yeah, I'd be, I'd be interested to know how it came up, what their frame of reference was even before oh, you started. I brought it up, but it, uh, I can't remember oh, right. of what reason. You seeded the, the discussion. Yeah. Did you? <laughs> <laughs> hey guys, so guys look, <laughs> look out the window. It's a to our Trans Trans Pacific Partnership deal. <laughs> what do you guys think of that? So there was a there was a bit of a story during the week that sort of got my attention. A number of Australians are affected by this in Lebanon. Uh, 60 Minutes reporter Tara Brown and her entire news crew, uh, an Australian mother and an international child rescue agency, a.k.a. a bunch of mercenaries, have all been captured and detained by the Lebanese police. And they're now facing a series of charges relating to kidnapping and assault, which is nice. Um, Sally Faulkner, the mother in question, had sole custody of her, her children. Uh, it was granted to her by the Australian Family Court on December 15, but she allowed them to go visit their father in Lebanon, whereupon he decided not to return them. So instead of contacting the federal police, as she was entirely within her rights to do, and they would have gone and extracted the kids for her, she got in contact with Channel 9, um, who then engaged a, a mercenary company and bankrolled the entire operation to the sum of about $100,000, as long as they could send along one of their news crews from 60 Minutes. Now, the operation went south... Uh, shortly after the children were abducted, uh, there were reports that their Lebanese grandmother was pistol whipped. I shouldn't be laughing when I say that, but, you know, mercenaries, you know what they're like. Um, and then the cops were on them, like, within 15 minutes of getting the kids. So uh, they're all in jail now in Lebanon, facing serious charges. Uh, Faulkner has, during the week, been negotiating with her ex-husband to get the charges dropped. One of the judges, uh, the, the Lebanese judges, actually tried to just chill everyone out and just like, let's get the parents talking and see what we can do. He has had a religious court in Lebanon grant him sole custody of the children. Not sure if that actually. That was done fits previously. With that was the, done some the, time ago. Yeah, with the legalities of yeah. it all. So he claims he has sole custody. She claims she has sole custody. So this judge is now trying to get them to both accept joint custody uh, and the rights of the kids to travel back and forth. It seems, you know, pretty reasonable. Uh, and if that happens, then he might drop the charges of kidnapping. Uh, maybe not the assault charges, though. <laughs> well, in recent developments, I heard that um, Miss Faulkner actually offered to renounce all custody of the children if she and the 60 Minutes crew is let free to go. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. I heard she was willing to renounce her sole custody. I didn't know all custody. Um, the Well, uh, she um, should be allowed to visitation rights within Lebanon. Yeah, wow. Well, you I mean, obviously, you'd, you'd feel pretty responsible for making the decision. I feel really... Like Channel 9 here are in the wrong. Like oh, definitely. Massively in the wrong. I'm assuming the Australian Federal Police just don't allow them the kind of access they'd want their news crew to have. Well, I mean, no. But look, I don't Australian think Federal the Police weren't going to launch themselves into Lebanon yeah. to seize back children. I don't think they would have done that themselves. Well, she's got a court order that's given the grant. Yeah, but, but they can't, so she can Australian Federal the Police can't go into another country. They can this. contact the, the authorities in the country. They can contact yeah. them. And then... Yeah. But I, I don't think there was going to be any pistol whipping, assault or no, no, kidnapping. No, they didn't there. even try and get a diplomatic solution. They just went <laughs> yeah. in with mercenaries and tried to yeah. abduct kids. Um, and they were armed, obviously, because I mean, if you because pistol whip someone, they had firearms. Seriously, I mean, what they did, I mean, this you should go to jail for that kind of thing. That's, well, they, 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 are, they, are likely to, they are likely to have time. So the Lebanese authorities 
have said that they continue, uh, even if the uh, father doesn't press charges against <coughs> the mother, they're going to continue to press charges relating to the assault and the attempted kidnapping against everyone else involved. So I imagine the Mercs who committed the pistol whipping probably not going to get out of there anytime soon. And who knows what's going to happen to the journos. Uh, obviously, if they're in negotiations, to try and if they're the ones them, but paying in the Mercs, then they deserve it as well. Well, I mean, it's it's if it's up to the government to release to, to not press charges against them as well, you know, like they've bankrolled an illegal operation, I think they're going to be held accountable. Definitely. Um, I did hear though that um, Sarah Brown's um, husband hasn't has not yet told her kids where mum is. Is there a bit worried about how to break that? That's a bit shit. Yeah, because, I mean, all very well with the kidnapping and assault and everything, but the trauma of the two kids getting snatched by people yeah. off the street. That's, I just can't imagine if, if I was at work and my boss is like, all right, so what we're going to do is we've got these mercenaries and we're going to fly you all into Lebanon and we want you to go and be like, okay, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, I'm with you. I'm with, is this potential? Like, what happens if it goes wrong? <laughs> oh, you go, you go to jail for a long time. Well, you're probably held responsible a little bit. Yeah, so the cameraman who's just along for the yeah, ride yeah. is like... Why am I in jail? <laughs> I actually read some interesting news articles which gave a bit more detail about how the operation actually panned out. So originally... Um, Was it like a let's, let's get scase kind of... Uh, <laughs> almost. Miss, Miss Faulkner apparently approached a different um, child um, Rescue repatriation um, guy and they were in negotiations, but she didn't have the money to actually uh, employ this guy. So she or... Somehow Channel 9 got involved. I don't know if she approached her or she was referred. And then Channel 9 got involved but persuaded her to use this other group who the first guy um, said, don't use those guys, they're cowboys. And subsequently it seems they were cowboys because they'd made quite a few rookie errors. For instance, when they were um, camped out at the site where they were going to do the snatch, there was a car with a camera crew with a camera pointed out now, that's quite a strange sight in Lebanon. So authorities were immediately alerted that there's some suspicious <laughs> guys with, you know, a TV camera. <laughs> and then when you send Dog the Hunter into Lebanon, it's, it's, yeah. he kind of sticks out a little bit. The main guy who was organising the rescue apparently... So the way they were going to um, uh, get the kids out of the country was by um, a high-speed boat. But he registered the, the berth that the boat was in tied to his hotel room. So it took them no time to find that boat. What's in contention is how the police actually found the safe house where the mother was holed up with the children. Mm. And apparently she called, when she was in the safe house with the children, she called the original guy she was going to go with and he allegedly could get them out and there were some options they were exploring and they tried to get the money from Channel 9 who said, no, they were in total damage control and we're trying to get <laughs> Well, hands up in the air, we're in the shit now. So, I mean, look, at the end of the day, this, this mother was obviously at a wit's end. The husband had cut off all communication. So yeah. when, once he stole the children, she had no contact with the children at all. So, you know, she obviously made some foolish decision. I don't understand why she didn't... And really, Channel 9 was enabling. I don't understand why she didn't do a lot more research on Google, which probably would have hinted that dragging a camera crew along for this sort of operation, not the best idea. I'm not sure you could even Google people who will kidnap my children for me and not have the feds show up at your door either. Well, I'm sure there's a lot of information, though, on how to rescue your kids when they've been abducted by the other partner from foreign countries. There's yeah, maybe. Golden rules of no camera crew. Yeah, look, it's, it's, it's pretty uh, serious stuff. I, I'm going to watch this, see how it turns out. Hopefully, they, they come to an arrangement, the mother and the father, and, and you know, sort their shit out because the kids should not be dragged through this kind of crap. No. This is just unacceptable parenting. No, it's terrible. On, on I mean, both their behalf. On both sides. Parent. It's kind of extreme. Yeah, I engaged mercenaries. That's uh, unacceptable yeah. parent. Well, he abducted them and then cut off all contact with mother and then she hired mercenaries. Like, who does that? <laughs> well, you know, these, these relationships get very acrimonious. I mean, you know... Very acrimonious. <laughs> Never once considered engaging mercenaries. <laughs> <laughs> Nor have I. You know, like, things have gone very south in my relationship in the past. Never thought, hey, you know what I should do is just get some mercs involved and then just sort that shit out with a pistol whipping. <laughs> So the final thing I want to wrap up on tonight is um, Johan Hari. Interesting okay. cat. Johan Hari, he was a darling journalist of the left until it was exposed, and I'm quoting here from the Guardian article written by Decker Aitkenhead on, um, on the 3rd of January 2015. So quoting from that, apparently many of his articles contain quotes apparently said to him, but in fact lifted from interviewees' books or from previous interviewers or other journalists. And he was a Apparently a plagiarist. Um, he was exposed as a sock pocket 
or someone who anonymously furthers his own interests online using a false identity, Hari maliciously amended the Wikipedia pages of journalists he disliked. <laughs> Among them... Did he uh, engage a mercenary company? <laughs> <laughs> oh, maybe. I'm only liking him a little bit better now. So among them, there was um, Telegraph columnist Christina Oden and the observers Nick Cohen, accusing them of anti-Semitism, homophobia and other toxic falsehoods. So this was back in 2011. So Johan Hari sort of, um, resigned from his position in the, the Guardian and sort of went underground. And he, he had a, at that time, I was listening to him, he had a podcast going at that time as oh, well. Oh, did he? And I was listening to him quite regularly and it suddenly just went dark. <laughs> yeah. So he um, kept his head down and then um, wrote a book called Chasing the Scream, which I've got here. Um, so investigated the impact of drug criminalization, collectively known as the war on drugs. And it was generally positively received. Um, now, the reason How I'm much of the book was plagiarised? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good point. Because I've heard a couple of interviews that he's done on this book because it's been out a while. It's on, on, our, on the Majority Report. Yeah. Exactly. That's where I was coming to. So back in January 2015, he was on the Majority Report plugging the book where he talked about it. And he was again on the Majority Report once again um, talking week. about uh, UNGAS. Um, I think it's uh, United Nations Talk... General uh, Assembly... On narcotics. Yeah, so this is the one they're doing this, this week coming up or something, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Now, I respect the majority report on Sam Serta, you know, wonderful interviewee, very switched on. But I find it sometimes hard to listen when he brings Johan Hari onto the show because, like, you know, this guy, he talks very passionately about the war on drugs, seems to bring up a lot of salient points, seems to be well informed on the topic. Sometimes I think he sort of simplifies the problems of drugs that, oh, people just have bad lives, that's why they get hooked on drugs. Sometimes I find it's a bit a simplification. But, you know, when he talks more about, you know, the war on drugs is propagated by America and all that, it's great. But I always wonder... Man, you've got that stain on your journalism. How, how, listening to these interviewers yeah, when and he's being, on the majority and being board. aware of it as well, I was aware of the fact that he was never asked about it, about, about that particular past. And I remember that first interview when it came up, I went, because I hadn't heard anything about Johan Hari since that, uh, that guard, probably that Guardian report. And then, um, yeah, just he just popped up and there was no mention made of it. So I don't know anything more about it because... Maybe he's refused to talk about it before the show. I, I don't know, but well, I mean, the, the interviews he's done on, on the on his book and and the um, the drug issues seem pretty good, and they certainly match up with a lot of other reporting I've heard. It's nothing. Well, it's because it's all plagiarized from the reporting you've heard. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, this is this is the only time that where I felt that there's a bit of a lack of journalistic integrity on the the majority report because Sam hasn't addressed that issue, whether in the interview <coughs> or outside of it. What's the big problem with plagiarism, though? I mean, in this <laughs> modern age, everyone gets stuff off Google and puts it in the stuff they're doing for work. Well, I mean, <laughs> I mean, like, don't pretend you don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, there was the Cut and paste obviously there was this plagiarism. Friend. You sort of have um, a grey <coughs> understanding of that, or you know what? You you could probably ask this question to Michael I'm Brooks on Twitter, yeah. and and he might be able to tell you. Um, because I, yeah, actually, I'm pretty interested to know. I'm not saying that he needs to be damned forever for those crimes, and definitely you can you know make amends and recreate yourself. Because I'm also also a little bit aware the reading I did around it was a lot of the the stuff that he's pulled up and there were some legitimate issues with some of the some of the way he paraphrased some things and you're talking about like, in chasing the scream the book no 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 oh. no this is from before the this plagiarism is from so forth. and I also remember a lot of it was just there was massively hyperbolically exploded like a lot a bigger deal was made out of it than than it should be in some ways because he was on the wrong side of some of these online groups you know there's it's a little bit like the um, the Sam, the Sam Harris crew. Yeah. He was on the opposite side to that. And so little issues or smaller issues became very big issues, at least on the online community, which is where he almost exclusively existed. So The, the weird thing for me, though, is the, the, the writing poison in people's Wikipedia entries. Uh, that's that's not healthy. That's, yeah. That, yeah. That's yeah. the bit I, of concern to, to be honest, that was like, the stuff I hadn't heard about. I hadn't heard about that's that. Not a healthy, that's not a healthy mind that does that. Soft like, puppetry and that I'm going to I'm going to imply this guy is an anti-Semite and that this one I know, is a homophobe. To be honest, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if the ones he was saying it actually were anti-Semitic and, and homophobic because he was that kind of anti... He was a hardcore leftist kind of... So they probably did say, writing for The Observer and... I think they're tabloid newspapers. Yeah. But whether that was deserved or whether there was any proof of it or not, yeah, it's absolutely, it's not. You can, you can trace edits on the Wikipedia relatively yeah. easy as demonstrated by this report. 
it's just it's just a quick way to get yourself in trouble. And w- why are you engaging in that behaviour? It's, it's very like petty. if you know take the high road. If you want to protect your journalistic career, just don't yeah. don't don't worry about you know trying to flame someone on the Wikipedia. Well, clearly, he's a regressive leftist. <laughs> well, I mean, look. <laughs> Uh, um, the reason I also bring this up is it's it's important to always remember that you, you should always know a little bit about the background of the journalists that you're reading when, when you're reading their material. You know, also try, you know, because people have these skeletons in their closet. I, I've got to be honest, that book sounds really interesting and I've, yeah. I've thought about buying, but uh, my my own opinion, because I, I really liked him. As I said, I listened to his podcast. I thought he was great. He's very um, eloquent when he speaks, yeah, yeah. passionate. And that was really disappointing to find when that, scandal came out so but having him pop back into the stage i'm going like well i just hope he's dotted all his eyes and crossed all his t's yeah. in this one so but the book's been out for a while now it so came out in january 2015 and he's still he's still doing he's still touring around it and yeah. doing this kind of stuff so i don't know i imagine he's undergoing a lot more observation than he did before oh, like definitely. people will be looking for any little slip up so well, it's good to have the spotlight shine on journalism though you know yes. to, to see what's there and it's good that get he's correct. He, he's come out of this, and because as I said, I respected his writing. I really liked his stuff, and the fact that when you, the bits that I saw that he supposedly plagiarized, I'm like, I get it. It probably is copied, but I, I, the message was fine. Everything, you know, he wasn't twisting anything in any way. He was just laying claim to some intellectual property that wasn't strictly his kind of thing. So, yeah, I don't know. I think he did at the time defend it by saying everyone else does it. <laughs> it's probably right. And as Dean said, everyone else Look, goes. everyone does it though. Like everyone goes and finds something on the internet. We do it for this show every week. We don't necessarily name our sources. Yes, pretty much. And as a journalist, he has the right to protect his sources. Even if he's quoting them 100% mm. <laughs> without changing it, he's protecting them. That's right. Yeah. Anywho, I think We actually that... got through a whole show without any American politics news. Yeah. Well, you got well, the they, North Carolina okay, thing. Okay, well, but... actually, they, have, they haven't had any more primaries this week, so... The the New York primary is coming up on the nineteenth, and that's going to be. Bernie and Hill had a debate, didn't they? And they, they did. Sorry, they did have a debate, but it was I don't know. There wasn't anything new in it to me. It, I don't think it. I'm not sure. I, I have, I'm far too much in the bubble. Are you to, turning into George Brandis? Yeah. <laughs> I'm far too much in the bubble to see how that debate might have affected any swaying voters. Well, it because, was more barbed than previous debates in terms of the yeah, way was, they were jousting with each that's other. Right. Someone I heard someone refer to it. There was a lot more elbows in that debate yeah. than. It was. The, I was reading interesting stats. I think Hillary's up by 281 delegates or something going into this. And then they go, but when you add the super, dele- super delegates on, that's like a 700 point lead. Yeah. And I was like, why are you assuming they're necessarily going to go with Hillary? Like, they can vote how they want. And and to be honest, Bernie Sanders has been targeting super delegates. And he's been, I guess, with the number of people that have been voting for him and the kind of momentum he has, he can actually display to down, down, down ballot um, elections that I can bring a certain amount of support. If I endorse you, a certain number of people are going to vote for you. Hmm. Especially if he's if he's giving good endorsements. I mean, this is why when they're all talking about the battle for his uh, whether he's going to endorse Hillary if Hillary eventually becomes a nominee, and I'm going if he endorses her and she hasn't actually uh, provided anything for the voters like the progressive voters if she hasn't actually provided anything his endorsement won't mean shit because it'll be selling out and that that left well wing. you never know he might endorse you might be like. He's better than Trump. Well, that, but that's what, <laughs> who, who did that? That was Lindsey Graham or something when he was endorsing Ted Cruz. He goes, well, I have to endorse someone, so I might as well be this. <laughs> yeah. Now that you mention um, the Republicans, it's interesting to see what's happening behind closed doors in the uh, manipulation of delegates. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, when the Republican delegates go to, it's Cleveland, isn't it? For the, Ohio, yeah. For the Cleveland, convention. Ohio. The delegates who have been, um, when the sorry, when the candidates have won a state and their the delegates come from the first round of voting, they have to vote. They have for, to vote who they for who they were originally delegated yeah. for. Yeah. But after that, they can vote for whoever they want. So what the machine's been doing, the Republican machine, has been ma- selecting who those delegates would be and selecting people that will most likely vote for Cruz on the second on vote. the second time around. Yeah. So it's. It's, and, and, and in that's not even it? a good thing. Though. And in Colorado, right. they just flat out declared that there will be no vote taken. We're going to dele- we're going to allocate the delegates, mm. and that's perfectly within the rules. Oh, is it? Yeah, no, they are not breaking any rules by doing this. So they're not having this a is, primary or a caucus. I th- they just said when I think they still had the vote, and they said we just that's just a straw poll. Doesn't mean anything. We're, we're not obliged to follow that in any way. And, and technically speaking, they are not. 
So they just declared, that's it. These these delegates will go to crew. So Trump is being lined up against. I, I don't know what this is going to mean too because he's got a lot... But Cruz is not a good answer to that. I mean, I know... Cruz is not a good answer at all. (laughs) I know they're like, well, it's not Trump, but it's like, Jesus, it's Ted Cruz. uh, Dan Carlin, I was just listening to Dan Carlin on the way over here. Has he got a new show? He's got a new one just coming out today. (laughs) And he was saying, this is kind of what what we're seeing. They're tipping, they're showing their hand a lot more. So the Democratic Party with their super delegates and how it's so completely biased... And all the electoral mechanisms that seem to be geared towards helping Hillary, like whenever something goes slightly wrong, it's always in Hillary's favour and blah, blah, blah. Um, and what do you know, Bernie got left off the ballot in this state and all this mm. kind of crazy stuff. Um, they're showing their hands so significantly that that people just aren't buying it. So you've got your Trump people. If if they decide that they're just going to outright just allocate someone else and, and Trump only misses out by 50 votes or something like 50 delegates... He's quite right in thinking like I don't know what my um, I don't know what my supporters are going to do. Maybe they'll ride. I don't know. But it's a contested convention. That's well, the other thing he's talking to be about. Fair, contested you... conventions haven't been done in so long. They are having to drag out these old dinosaurs from back in 1976 when the last time they had one because nobody actually knows how the fuck they work. Yeah. But if you are, if you see that democracy is is being subverted and it's not working and Trump's your man <clears> and then they deny him that, I look you might riot. And tr- Trump's right. Like, I don't know what they're going to do. Like, if you keep doing this, no, no, crazy that's shit. what I mean. It's quite right. And this is what Dan Carlin was saying. He goes, We're at a stage where things have been exposed so much that people clearly understand what's going on now mm. and are not happy with it. And the opportunity, uh, he, he goes into a lot more depth, but the opportunity for a third or more, or more parties is distinctly becoming a, a possibility. I could see the Republican Party splitting. Uh, like yeah, but I definitely can see the. But there's so many. There's so much infrastructure geared towards having just those two parties that whatever third party gets comes off, it's such an uphill battle for them to get out to all the states and to be yeah, you know, in all places. I mean, yeah, but it ha- it's happened. But I mean, in the past. but I mean, Trump's already pretty much at war with Fox. He doesn't doesn't want Fox News being. You know, he's he's, he's very clearly yeah. not doing uh, debates on their show, yeah. not doing interviews. But I mean, on the on the left, you have got these Bernie or Bus people that say that. Um, if, if Bernie doesn't get in, they're not going to vote for Hillary. And they're all talking third party. I mean, Bernie, I, I seriously doubt that Bernie would ever... Could, well, actually, he, he's not even on the ballot in certain states yeah. as an independent, so he couldn't do it as a third party. But they're talking a possible split down in the Democratic Party as well because there's a vast number of people. And you, and you listen to the way the Democratic Party is just so dismissive of all these new voters. They're just not into it. Like, to the extent that these Bernie or Bus people will actually exist for the general election... That's entirely up to how good the candidates are. So mm. if Hillary Clinton wants those voters, she knows what they're asking for. She could appeal to them quite easily. But if they just dismiss them as they have been, who knows what they... They may may not vote. She may suppress the vote. You would think, though, that she would offer Bernie the vice presidency. No, I don't think, I no, don't think he would operate as a vice president. He him. might not want it, but you'd think that would be the offer you'd No, no, she wouldn't, she wouldn't give him... Because you'd want those voters... And you'd want to cash in on his popularity. See, but they do want those voters. But as I said, that they, they're also... There's a difference between her and what happened between her and Obama. Her and Obama are essentially presenting mostly the same positions in everything. So yeah, but he for the voters, more with the people. So when the vote, when the nominee was decided, for those other voters to go, okay, I'll vote for them, it wasn't a big deal. There was not a huge ideological difference between them. Hmm. There's a big difference between Hillary and Bernie, and and so those people have a legitimate thing. Well, I'm not voting for her. That's not who I want. So I don't know. It's it's going to be very interesting. Bearing in mind, in America, there is the option to just not vote. Exactly. And when, when the option's so clearly easy like that, then everyone's going, well, you're just going to give it to Trump. I go, well, and, and that, they're sort no, no, of. You're giving it to Trump by not giving me a candidate I would vote for. <laughs> and that's right. It's, as I said, these voters are very, very vocal about what they want. She could easily get them if she wants them. They're deciding to how cheaply they can get them and they don't want to give like free mm. educated and this kind of stuff. So, yeah, anyway, it's, it's still interesting, but not really much happening just at the moment. And on that note, I think we can call it a day. Cool. See you Thanks later. for listening. See you next week. See ya. Bye.